The following program is classified M. It contains some violence. Channel 10 recommends viewing by mature audiences. Hello and welcome to Wanted Live, the show where you can help make Australia a safer place. In cooperation with police around the country, we're asking for your help solving crimes. Coming up, a Wanted special event. Tonight, 20 of the most wanted in Australia. Men and women all on the run, some highly dangerous. Followed the victim downstairs, resulting in the victim being stabbed 11 times. We reveal the hit list so you can help track them down, including a woman wanted after a frenzied knife attack in Melbourne. You know, something I'd never come across before. It was just horrific. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Also tonight, a baffling cold case. Two kids, a wife and a quiet life in the country. Who killed Howard Tyrrell? Someone's out there that's done it. They're not going to pay for it unless someone knows something, tells someone. That's tonight on Wanted. Good evening. Police and Crime Stoppers are appealing for our help tonight as we exclusively launch Operation Rome. Over the next hour, we'll introduce you to 20 of the most wanted men and women in Australia so you can help track them down. That's Operation Rome shortly. But first, an urgent appeal from police in Melbourne. They need your help in relation to two sexual assaults. Crime investigator Neil Mercer has the story. It's mid-afternoon, March 28 this year. Here at Melbourne's Flinders Street Station, it's business as usual, except for one 30-year-old woman working in a shop nearby. She's about to get a very nasty shock. A man's walked into a store at the Flinders Street Station. At this time, he's walked up to one of the uh, staff members, a, a female staff member, and he's had a conversation with her for a few moments, asking her about if she had a boyfriend, uh, he's then grabbed hold of her and kissed her. The man leaves the store. The distressed woman calls police, but they have very few clues. No, this woman didn't know this man at all. Never met him before. Bizarrely, six weeks later, the man returns. He walks into the store, up to the same female. She's in the store by herself, shakes her hand and then uh, starts a conversation with her again. And this conversation escalates into some sexual um, threats and saying he'll be back the following day. It was then that police got their best clue. CCTV vision captured by several cameras identified a person of interest. Police want to speak to this man. And there's another clue. They believe he catches the same train. So the male we wish to speak to catches the uh, Cranbourne line, arrives here about 2.30 p.m. Yep. In the afternoon from there he exits the uh, train and then walks down through the subway. And he's arriving at about the same time, both times? Yeah, both times it's been 2.30 uh, p.m. in the afternoon. And so somebody travelling on this line, on the, on the Cranbourne line, must have seen him? Yeah, someone would know this person. The uh, footage we have is clear of him exiting the train and walking through the subway. And we'd be very interested in speaking to this male. And if you have any information that could help track down that man, please contact Crime Stoppers. Operators around Australia are ready to take your calls right now, or you can report online. Matt? Thanks, Sandra. Now to someone who was watching Wanted when he says he discovered he was wanted himself. There was a warrant out for Steve Allen in connection with an alleged aggravated burglary in Melbourne in June. He's now handed himself into police and is helping them with their inquiries. In another update, South Australian police say the investigation into the murder of 16-year-old Karen Williams is progressing extremely well. The search for her body in Coober PD has been temporarily suspended, but police plan to return. Sandra? Thanks, Matt. Now to Operation Rome, the search for 20 of the most wanted people in Australia. Some have skipped bail, others have breached parole. Some are wanted for very serious offences. And one of the most wanted in this lineup is this man, Michael Davison Tillman. Tillman was arrested and charged over an alleged attempted murder on the Gold Coast in 2010. 
But while waiting trial, he disappeared and has been on the run ever since. Matt Doran investigates. This is Michael Tillman. Take a good look, because if you run into him, you need to know that he's one of Australia's most wanted. Michael Tillman grew up in Sydney's South, an ordinary beachside lifestyle. But this bloke had one very special talent. Police believe Michael Davison Tillman is making his living hustling pool. Michael Tillman's not the kind of guy you'd want to meet in a pool comp. Because Michael Tillman is wanted for attempted murder. Back in 2010, Tillman was in Queensland, hanging out with his mates. What do we know about his life here on the Gold Coast? He had links to various nightclubs within the Surface Paradise precinct. So is he someone that would have been known as a bit of a pool shark? That's quite possible that, uh, that that was a source of his income. Uh, his actual employment status at the time was unknown. On the 26th of September, Tillman and his mates were at the opening of a new club called Vanity. Afterwards, Tillman, Troy Kiss and a few others continued to party on back in his Gold Coast apartment. Detective Senior Constable Michael Bradley says it was around three in the morning when a fight broke out. As a result of that altercation, the victim has removed himself from the situation and, and uh, caught the lift downstairs from the apartment where another incident has taken place, resulting in the victim being stabbed 11 times. This victim must have been in a very bad way. He was in a very bad way. Uh, I believe uh, the victim received uh, a number of internal injuries and was subsequently stayed in hospital for an, a, a good period of time after the incident. Three days later, Tillman is charged with attempted murder and bailed to appear here at the Southport Magistrates Court. These CCTV pictures presented to the court at the committal hearing recorded the events that night. Police alleged that the man in the dark top is Michael Tillman, seen here running towards where Mr Kiss is standing. Following him is another party guest, holidaying Irish policeman Trevor Markham. After the attack, Kiss stumbles onto the road. Trevor Markham goes to help. He said in evidence at the committal hearing, I had my hands over his ribs and it felt like bubbles were coming from the wound. The CCTV then shows a man who the police allege to be Tillman walking away. In September 2011, he's on bail and having drinks in the Benoa Tavern when a brawl starts. Police allege Tillman was involved in that brawl. For an unknown reason, uh, Tillman's associates were involved in an altercation with, a, with, with the associates of the victim, uh, which ultimately spilled outside after security separated uh, both parties. During the altercation, a man was headbutted and bitten on his nose and cheek. Uh, after the attack, uh, Tillman and his friends, what did they do then? How did they leave the venue? Yeah, both Tillman and his associates uh, ran through the car park and through bushland and ultimately through a creek, uh, where it's believed that they were picked up by an unknown person later on. Tillman is wanted in relation to the attempted murder charge in Surfers Paradise. Police also want to talk to him about the Benoa attack. Now, Michael Bradley and the police are leading the hunt for Tillman are based up there on the Gold Coast, and they simply don't know where he is, but what they do know is that he's not in surfer's paradise. They've made it far too hot for him there. The last they'd heard, he'd paid a driver in cash to take him back to Sydney, and that's where the trail went cold. That was two and a half years ago, and despite an intensive police search spanning two states, Tillman has not been seen since. So Sandra, I can tell you, the detective leading the hunt for Michael Tillman, he is absolutely tenacious when it comes to this case. I spent a day with him. He said that this matter is on his mind almost daily. He is checking every conceivable database, exhausting every conceivable avenue to try and track him down. Uh, and I really don't think that he's going to rest until he's behind bars. Now, in your story, it says that the trail goes cold in New South Wales. Do police still think that may be where he is. They do, uh, but the search is complicated by the fact that at this moment Tillman could be anywhere in Australia, likely operating under a false name, likely uh, having some sort of a disguise as well. So that's complicating things.
What frustrated police when they did know his whereabouts uh, was just where he was getting his income, how he was sourcing his money. Mm. Uh, there was no trail there. So uh, that continues to frustrate them now and that complicates things too. They think that he might be active in the pool circuit, perhaps in the professional circuit, perhaps operating as a, uh, as a bit of a pool shark as well. So that could potentially hold the key to solving this case. But to answer your question, the best intelligence they have is that he might be operating uh, or living somewhere in Sydney's east, but Michael Tillman could be anywhere in Australia. Plenty of good information, new information, and a fantastic image of him. Let's hope it leads to an arrest. Some ex an excellent image of him, so let's hope someone can recognise him. Well, there are two other men that are being targeted on Operation Rome, wanted over murder charges. Graham Jean Potter failed to appear on bail in Melbourne in relation to two charges of conspiracy to murder. Now there's a $100,000 award for any information that could lead to his conviction. And there's a warrant for the arrest of Brady Ralph Hamilton. He's wanted for questioning over a Sydney murder in 1999. Our exclusive coverage of Operation Rome continues next on Wanted. When we investigate a huge drug bust that's led to a nationwide manhunt. Also, the bizarre case of a woman who's breached parole after a series of stabbings in a church. We grabbed the um, assailant and um, I got the knife out of her, her clutch. Welcome back. You're with Wanted's Operation Rome special, where we're trying to help police and crime stoppers catch 20 of the most wanted people in Australia. One of them is this woman, Susan Sewell. She's wanted for breaching parole after serving two years of a three and a half year sentence. Neil Mercer investigates her violent and very bizarre case. Sometimes our normal day-to-day -day lives are interrupted by an act of violence so bizarre and unexpected, it takes a little while to realise what's actually happening. It's August 27, 2002. Inside the Collins Street Baptist Church here in Melbourne, preparations are underway for a concert that's going to be held a little later on in the evening. Everything's going according to plan, except for a homeless woman who's setting up her sleeping gear at the top of the stairs. Her name is Susan Sewell. She's 46 years old. Officials don't want her blocking the entrance when the patrons begin to arrive. I'm sorry, there's a concert happening here tonight. Would you mind moving on, please? I noticed this, whom I thought was a man at the time, had this knife in his hand um, and I thought it was one of those knives where the blade goes back into the handle and I wondered what he was doing with that. Ross Looty is selling tickets. He sees Sewell suddenly stab the woman from the doorway. It all happened so quickly. She then attacks an usher. Well-known ABC radio presenter Peter Birch is also present. Peter right. and the other guy from Music of Eva, the three of us, we grabbed the um, assailant and um, I got the knife out of her clutch. But she wasn't, she didn't offer any resistance really. Not a word, not a sound, no. It's only after Sewell is subdued that Birch realises he's been stabbed in the side. All three victims are hospitalised for Ross Looty. It's an evening he will never forget. It was, um, you know, purely, you know, something I'd never come across before. It was just horrific. All three men who overpowered Sewell are given bravery awards. Susan Sewell was sent to jail for three and a half years. The court heard she had absolutely no memory of the stabbings. It also heard she had no prior criminal record. To this day, Susan Sewell remains something of a mystery. About two years after the crime, Sewell is released from prison and is placed on parole. She breaches her parole conditions and is now wanted by Victoria Police. Well, joining us now, one of the victims of that church stabbing, Melissa Compagnoni, and the policeman leading the investigation, Detective Inspector Michael Fruin. Melissa, to you first, if we could. You were an usher in the church that night. To the extent that you're comfortable, Melissa, what are your memories, your recollections of that evening? Yes, that afternoon I was uh, standing at the entrance of the venue greeting people and a woman who I recognised uh, from outside walked in to the door straight towards me, looked me in the eye, said hello and drew what turned out to be a hunting knife from behind her back and stabbed me in the stomach. 
Can I ask you, Melissa, what were the nature of your injuries and how challenging has the recovery been for you? Yeah, the knife perforated my large intestine and it nicked my pancreas, so I spent two weeks in hospital. And since then, I have had a number of uh, abdominal surgeries that were in part complicated by the fact that I'd been opened up that first time. So I've had a difficult 10-year medical history. Detective Inspector, it sounds like we are dealing with a, a particularly dangerous person here. Can I ask you, uh, just how dangerous is Susan Sewell? Well, obviously, from Susan's history that we're presenting before you today, she's prone to violent acts, indiscriminate violent acts, so I'd be encouraging the community, if they see her, to contact police and not approach in the first instance. She's also known as an alias of Susan Savetta. She's come under police notice in a number of other jurisdictions in Western Australia, South Australia, Canberra and obviously Victoria. So um, I'd be encouraging members of the community that if they see her to contact police rather than approach her. Detective Inspector and Melissa Compagnoni, we're grateful for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra? Thanks, Matt. There are four others on the Operation Rome wanted list who have also breached parole. Duck Dung Lu was released on parole after serving time for drug trafficking. He's known to frequent Sydney's Bankstown area and also Melbourne's western suburbs. Alison Rose Abdullah has convictions including reckless conduct, endangering life and assaults. John Leslie Gerard, who's now 68, has multiple convictions for fraud. And Wayne Tobin has also breached parole. He's previously been convicted of assault, endangering life and firearm offences. So if you've seen any of these people, the number to call is on your screen. Joining us now, one of the driving forces behind Operation Rome, and that's Victoria's Deputy Police Commissioner Tim Cartwright. Deputy Commissioner, thanks for your time. Tell us just how dangerous thanks, are these men and women on tonight's list? Well, you've read out some of those names yourself. Some of these people have serious convictions for assaults. Some are wanted for murder. Some are wanted for drug trafficking. It varies, but we can be sure that most of them are out there committing offences now. What's the criteria then for making tonight and Australia's most wanted? Pretty simple. We just ask all the jurisdictions, the states, to nominate their most wanted people. Um, so there's a whole variety of people on there. And we then take the list from those who we consider to be the most serious um, offenders and uh, the most at risk. Earlier in tonight's show, we listed that there was a $100,000 reward for information on Graham Jean, Hop Jean Potter. And yet tonight there are cash incentives for viewers who can give you information on all the men and women in tonight's most wanted list. Yes, Sandra, some of those on the list, um, indeed, we're offering rewards for, not all of them, but most of those people are serious offenders. We need the community to come forward. If they know about these people, they'll tell us, and on some of those occasions, uh, they'll be eligible for rewards. Deputy Police Commissioner Tim Cartwright, thank you for your time. Thank you, Sandra. Matt? Thanks, Sandra. We'll stay with us after the break. More of Australia's 20 Most Wanted including the hunt for an alleged kingpin over drug cultivation and trafficking charges. Plus, our forensic scientist, Dr Xanthi Mallet, warms up a brutal cold case murder. Someone's out there that's done it. People know what's, what's happened to Howard Tyrrell, but someone's got a conscience. This is Wanted's Operation Rome special, featuring 20 of the most wanted people in Australia. A number are wanted for alleged drug offences, and one of those is Paul Brian Madden. It's alleged that Madden was part of a syndicate involved in the cultivation and trafficking of cannabis. He was charged over that and also alleged firearm offences in April last year, but failed to appear in court. Our WA crime investigator, Nick Way, looks at his case. The misty gullies and lonely hills in Western Australia's south are both stunning and secluded. The isolation of a national park provides the perfect cover for cannabis crops. And each year, police perform high wire acts to find them. Operations with names like Slasher and Tall Timbers take to the skies every year in a bid to stamp out the crops. Often, it's a massive haul. Police can find hundreds of mature plants. 
Off the back of one call, police decided to look more closely at the whole region. They mounted a two-year operation that targeted people suspected of cultivating and selling cannabis on a commercial scale. At dawn on April 12 last year, heavily armed police gather here in Rocky Gully, about 400 kilometres south of Perth. Now this place is lonely enough. It's surrounded by blue gum plantations and dense forests, and I'd say only about 100 or so people live here. But the main police target that day was actually an even lonelier place. It was a little farmhouse about 25 k's out of town. It was later reported at a bail hearing that police found the tenant and three other people at the rented house. They were allegedly in possession of two firearms, a semi-automatic rifle and a sawn-off semi-automatic 22 like this, but with a laser sight. Both were loaded. Also, according to bail evidence, police found a sleepout next to the house, converted for drying cannabis. The setup had allegedly produced 15 kilograms of ready-to-sell product with a street value of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Police also found $11,500 in cash. The harm that this amount of cannabis, if it had have been left to get out on the streets, would be immeasurable. After finding this drying room in this very, very nondescript house, and the sheer amount of cannabis and cash, and of course those two loaded firearms, police thought they were onto something big. So they decided just to watch and wait back here. And sure enough, down the road came three more people. Two men faced almost a dozen charges over the find. One of them, the alleged ringleader, Rocky Gully local Paul Madden, skipped bail. He's been on the run since October. We suspect uh, fled interstate to escape prosecution. Um, we're also investigating leads that he may be in Western Australia at this point in time. If you see Paul Brian Madden, police have some firm advice. I'd warn people that wanted people can behave unpredictably. Don't approach them. Um, just notify police where you've seen that person. And four others join Paul Madden on the Operation Rome wanted list over alleged drug offences. Graham James Rockford is wanted over the charges relating to the possession of large amounts of cannabis in South Australia. He is also known as Graham Keyes. Naomi Nikita Dixon is charged with the possession of a prohibited drug with intent to sell and has been on the run since failing to appear in court in WA. It's alleged Uzo Johnson Anajemba was found in possession of a marketable quantity of heroin in the ACT two years ago. And finally, Chase Dylan Fitzgerald is wanted for allegedly being involved in trafficking drugs in Queensland in 2009. Well, stay with us. There's plenty more ahead on Wanted, including our forensic scientist, Dr Xanthi Mallet, who joins a fresh police investigation into a cold case murder. There was heaps of circumstantial evidence, but uh, unfortunately you can't go to court on circumstantial evidence alone. Also, a daring daylight carjacking caught on camera. And a brazen dog napping, who made off with Rami at a busy shopping centre. Plus, can you help with our earlier stories on Wanted? Police would like to speak with this man in relation to two Melbourne sexual assaults. And this conversation escalates into some sexual um, threats. And the hunt for Michael Davison Tillman, who's on the run over an alleged attempted murder. Uh, Mr Tillman has followed the victim downstairs where another incident has taken place, resulting in the victim being stabbed 11 times. Welcome back, you're with Wanted. And we continue our rundown of 20 of the most wanted people in Australia. Can you help police track these people down? Hu Yong Neo is alleged to have been involved in manufacturing and using fraudulent credit cards in Melbourne with an alleged financial gain of more than $135,000. Mohammed Rahim Shorki is alleged to have blackmailed a victim in South Australia, demanding a large sum of money under the threat of violence. And Mohammed Hussein, he's alleged to have been involved in multiple deceptions in Melbourne 
where victims have been tricked into paying out deposits for garden work, which is then never completed. Police say more than $350,000 is involved. Now, as we said earlier, a cash reward of up to $1,000 may be available for information leading to an arrest. Now, to former Detective Superintendent Terry Dalton with the last of the wanted people targeted in Operation Road. Terry? Thanks, Matt. And these four blokes are wanted on some pretty serious charges. Tihira Hetaraka is alleged to have been involved in an aggravated robbery in Darwin in 2011. It's believed he was living in Western Australia last year. Scott Andrew Awima allegedly impersonated a policeman during an aggravated robbery in South Australia in 2006. Edward Charles Davies is wanted over an alleged rape in South Australia two years ago. Now, Ian Roy Burr, he's wanted for allegedly being involved in a number of sexual offences against children under 16 in the Redcliffs area of Victoria in July 2007. Police believe Burr may now be in Western Australia or Central Australia, and you can understand why police are anxious to get hold of those blokes as soon as they can. You certainly can. Thanks very much, Terry. So, we've just met 20 of Australia's most wanted and dangerous people. Do not approach them. If you have any information at all about any of the people on this wanted list, please call Crime Stoppers. Let's see how good you are at helping make the community a safer place. Sandra? Thanks, Matt. Now to a cold case murder that's the centre of a fresh investigation. Horse breeder Howard Tyrrell was shot dead near Dubbo in the central west of New South Wales 36 years ago. At various stages, police believe they've come close to finding the killer, but there's never been enough evidence to lay charges. This update on the case from our forensic scientist, Dr Xanthi Mallet. It's a cold winter's night in country New South Wales. 42-year-old horse breeder, Howard Tyrrell, sits down for dinner. Ah, oh, thanks. Alice, his wife of 12 years, is heading off to her weekly sewing course in nearby Dubbo. I'm off to Tafe now. She's also dropping right. some eggs off to a friend. Okay. see you later. Their two children, aged two and five, are staying with their grandparents. Sometime before 9.30, Somebody, or something, causes Howard to go outside. The dogs don't bark, so whoever's out there is unlikely to be a stranger. Tyrrell is dead before he hits the ground. I don't have any memories of him as such. Only what people have told me, you know, that he was just a really nice guy and yeah, he's an excellent horseman. It must have been hard for you. How old were you? I was two. What's it been like for you since then? What was the hardest thing? Not knowing why someone would do it. Mm what your life would be like. You think about all the things you missed out on? Yeah, because he was into horses and I ride horses and to have a father teach you stuff would be nice. The Tyrrell family moved out of here many years ago, but the farm remains, as does the mystery of who killed Howard Tyrrell and why. You tend to think in cases such as this that the motive is going to be sex or money. And the day after Harold Tyrrell's murder, Dubbo was rife with rumour. Detectives from Sydney and Dubbo were swarming all over the property and well beyond. Retired detective Sergeant Ross Tye investigated the case 36 years ago. So set the scene for me on that night. Where was Howard? Xanthi, when we got here, uh, Howard Tyrrell's body was in that vicinity there. Obviously there was a single gunshot through his side and uh, killing him instantly. The autopsy revealed powder burns from the gunshot on Howard's clothing. In my experience, this indicates the gun was fired at very close range, a telling piece of evidence. So do you think this is somebody he knew then? We were of the opinion, yes. It was someone that knew Harold's movements, 
Uh, he was certainly familiar with the, all the dogs that were here. There's no dogs barked that night. Um, he certainly knew his way around the place and uh, he was familiar with the movements of the family. Apart from the body and the powder burns, there's only one other piece of evidence, footprints across here. That paddock had been freshly cultivated the day before and in that paddock we found fresh tracks walking to the homestead and then on leaving they were running. How did you determine that? By the length of the, the paces. Yeah, big strides, yep. running. So just where do those footsteps lead and what else do the police know about the killer? Find out when Xanthi Mallet's investigation continues. That's after the break. You're with Wanted. Back now to our hunt for the killer of horse breeder Howard Tyrrell, who was shot dead in central New South Wales 36 years ago. Forensic scientist Dr Xanthi Mallet continues her investigation. Howard Tyrrell walks outside his country home and is hit by a shotgun blast. Police later find footprints in a nearby paddock. They lead towards the house of a man who had recently bought a shotgun. But there's no evidence to link this gun to the attack. This was an exhaustive investigation, wasn't it? It was. Uh, all our team were on it, plus many, many uniformed fellows searching for possible, a possible weapon or, or, or similar cartridges to no avail. You didn't find anything? No. We're kind of missing that key piece, aren't we? We certainly are. Uh, there was heaps of circumstantial evidence, but uh, unfortunately you can't go to court on circumstantial evidence alone um, because you lose every time. At the time her husband is killed, Alice Tyrrell's TAFE course is over. She's now visiting a friend in town, dropping off eggs from home. She's there for an hour. As Alice later tells police, when she arrives home, the lights are on and the television is blaring. Alice stays up for another hour, sewing. It's only when she gets ready to go to bed that Alice discovers her husband is not there and begins to search. Thirty-six years on, the case remains unsolved, but police aren't giving up. The case was allocated to uh, the uh, Western Region Unsolved Homicide Team. We've been investigating this case for a number of years. It's been lengthy. We've re-interviewed all the people who were still alive back from 1977. But unfortunately, there's insufficient evidence to uh, warrant a prosecution on. What do you think the motive was in this case? It's, it's difficult. There's a number of motives and we're just keeping our, our um, an open mind and everything and have not dis discounted anything in this case. So why is a man gunned down in his own yard? Who did it and why? Decades later, those questions still haunt Howard Tyrrell's daughter, Rachel. Your father's supposed to walk you down the aisle. All that sort of stuff, you know, no one thinks about. And you think about that? All the time. How can you not? It's your whole world, you know. And it's a whole world because you don't know why. Someone's out there that's done it. People know what's, what's happened to Howard Tyrrell. Well, someone's got a conscience. We've got some sort of remorse to you know, come forward with that information. Doesn't matter how small or how irrelevant they think it is. It, it could be that crucial piece to the puzzle. I wish someone would be caught, you know, just for why. Why, why someone would do it? why someone would just shoot someone who was a fantastic man and I don't, just don't understand. Well, Xanthi joins us now. And Xanthi, Howard Tyrrell was killed by a shotgun blast and police think it was at close range. Explain the ballistics of shotgun blasts. 
Well, if we look at the anatomy of a cartridge to start with, this is actually an unfired cartridge, and this is one after it's been fired. And you can clearly see that the end is actually opened out. Now, what is inside there is this element, which is called a wad, and it sits there. And when the, uh, when the firing pin strikes the end, this is actually ejected out of the cartridge. With these ball bearings? These are actually lead shot, and they come okay. in all sorts of different sizes, depending on what you're actually using it for, what you're hunting. So those sit inside these little wads, and that's fired out. Now, what's interesting about these wads is, I've got a few different examples here, and that's because if that's actually recovered, then that's actually identifiable to the manufacturer because each of the manufacturers has a different style, colour, um, design of these. So if you can recover that, you can actually determine what cartridge was used, even if you don't have the actual cartridge itself. So explain how you can tell if someone was shot at close range. Well, if we go to my friend here, we've got two different types of uh, injury pattern, you would say, but it looks like almost it's been created by a different kind of weapon, but this is both a 12-gauge shotgun, which is what we see here, just at different ranges. This is within about a metre, and basically what's happened here, the gun shot hasn't had a chance to dis dissipate over a wider range, mm -hmm. so it's all come out basically almost as one projectile, in through the this hole here, and that's actually left some gunshot residue around the edge as well. And this is at three metres, so quite considerably further away, but you can see a completely different pattern where the shot is actually radiated outwards. Now, that one at three metres, would that be lethal? I would say both of these would be lethal. I mean, these kind of uh, lead shot, 10 to 15 metres could bring down something the size of a pig, which is actually a good proxy for humans. So I think both of these would probably be lethal anywhere in the torso area. And if not lethal, cause a lot of damage. Absolutely. Santi, thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Santi. Let's hope after more than three decades, police can solve Howard Tyrrell's murder. Now to some crimes caught on camera. And with the details, here's Terry again. Thanks, Matt. We start at what I reckon has got to be the unluckiest joint in the country. This week it was robbed for the third time in four weeks. The first robbery at the Maryong service station and convenience store in Western Sydney happens on July the 15th. The robber is all hoodied up, so the clothes are the only clues to who he is. Now, a week later, and this time it's two blokes, and we get a glimpse of what they look like. Here's a close-up of the first one. He's got a ginger goatee, and the bloke behind him has got a black beard. It's not known how much money was taken in the third robbery, but in the first two, a substantial amount of cash was handed over. Now to a timely tale on Marrickville Road in Sydney. It's May 7th, and two men arranged to meet a man selling an expensive designer watch outside a car yard. But very quickly, it turns into a bad deal. A knife and pistol are involved. What transpires can't be shown, but the result is the watch seller is left with stab wounds to his upper leg. Here are the two men again police want to talk to, with a cyclist who rode past during that incident who may be a witness. If you recognise them, you know what to do. Off to Perth. Now, a McDonald's car park in Maddington, 3.30 on the 2nd of March. Two men walk up to the car on the right of screen. They push the driver out of his Ford Territory and drive off. Their next target is a nearby Blockbuster video store. One offender has now been caught, but is refusing to help police so they're still looking for his mate. Here he is earlier. He's described as having a dark complexion and around 175 centimetres tall. Matt. Good on you, Terry. Let's hope someone can recognise them. Stay with us on Wanted after the break. The hunt for Rami the Pedigree Pooch, who's become the victim of a dog napping. This is Wanted, and here's an unusual crime that's becoming an increasing problem around Australia. If you're a dog owner, it'll make you very angry. The pooch in question here is Rami, and the man you see here picking him up is not his owner. The real owner had left Rami tied up outside a store in the Brisbane suburb of New Farm while he ducked inside. Rami and the man are captured on camera as they make their way out of the complex. Can you help identify the man with Rami? If you can, you'll make his real owner a very happy man. Matt? Let's hope someone can help. Thanks, Sandra. And that Crime Stoppers number again is 1800 333 000. Operators are standing by right now, and you can, of course, report online. You can also catch up with all our cases at wantedtv.com.au or even suggest a story. 
and you get all our updates on Twitter at WantedTVHQ. The hashtag is WantedTV. Now to a quick recap of the most wanted people featured in Operation Rome tonight and some of your tweets. There's an arrest warrant out for Susan Sewell. She's breached parole after serving time for a series of stabbings in a church. This tweet from Olivia Brody, who says the Su Susan Sewell story is horrible and she needs to be called ASAP. Michael Davison Tillman is wanted over an alleged attempted murder charge on the Gold Coast. Melody June tweets, I really hope you find Tillman. I really want to know where he is. So do we all. And there's a warrant out for the arrest of Paul Brian Madden over alleged drug and firearm offences in WA. So joining us now is the head of Crime Stoppers New South Wales, Peter Price. And Peter, what's been the response to Operation Rome in the last hour? Look, it's been phenomenal, um, Sandra. We're getting basically a call every 46 seconds, which means that the public are really behind this and we have some really good information. Fantastic. Have you was giving specific information to police? Yes, that's right. Uh, no superficial information, specific information. So we hope that that will lead to, uh, to an arrest pretty soon. Tell us about your success rate with Operation Rome in previous years. Uh, in previous years, we uh, had our first arrest within, uh, within uh, half an hour. Um, so it could be a good night tonight if we get that. And otherwise, we had four in 24 hours. But without the public's help, uh, we couldn't do it. Indeed. Thanks for your time. Let's hope we do even better this year. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Well, next week, we bring you an extended story on the hunt for Australia's most wanted man. We met Graham Jean Potter briefly earlier in the show. Next Monday at 8.30, the full story. Graham Jean Potter has been on the run for more than three years. He was bailed to appear at the Melbourne Magistrates Court in February 2010, but he never showed up. Before he took off, he was living here in Tasmania's Coles Bay with his wife, Cherie. He won't come back to Coles Bay because a lot of people in Coles Bay would recognise him, so he, he would stay away, he would go to a new area. He's been seen in far north Queensland and there have been numerous other sightings of him across the country. This is the last CCTV of Potter. He's solidly built, 175 centimetres tall and has used a number of fake names, including Josh Lawson and John Page. And that's Wanted for another week. We hope you can join us at 8.30 next Monday when we'll be reporting your efforts in helping catch 20 of Australia's most wanted. Until then, on behalf of the whole team, have a good night. And remember, evidence is everywhere, so if you see something, say something.